Hello and welcome to the State of the Service Roadshow for New South Wales. My name is Kylie Crane and I'll be your MC and facilitator for today's session. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Ngunnawal people who are the traditional custodians of the land on which we're broadcasting from today and pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to acknowledge the custodians of the various lands from which you're participating today and extend my respects to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who are joining the session with us. Today's session will commence with a keynote address from the Australian Public Service Commissioner, Mr Peter Woolcott, AO. This will be followed by a short video and then a panel discussion where you, the audience, can ask questions of any of our speakers today. Chris Birra and Ali Jenkins will join Peter on the panel to answer your questions. I'll tell you a little bit more about Chris and Ali later in the session. A little housekeeping before we get started. If you have any issues, please send us a message via the GovTeams chat box. The chat box is also where you can send your questions through for the panel session. Now it is my pleasure to hand over to the Australian Public Service Commissioner, Peter Woolcott, for the Commissioner's address. Thank you, Kylie, for your introduction. And good morning, everyone. It's good to be with you all. I would also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today <coughs> and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I extend that respect to our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander colleagues <coughs> joining us today. So today we welcome our New South Wales colleagues to our State of Service Roadshow series. This is an opportunity to reflect on 2021 and to discuss where we're heading for the rest of this year and beyond. It has been a tough year for many Australians, and I'm certain everyone listening here has been impacted in one way or another. With more than 27,000 APS staff in New South Wales, no doubt some of you have also been impacted by the recent floods. The challenges thrown at the APS have been significant, and in my view, you have all performed admirably. The APS has an astonishing breadth of responsibilities. There are more than 153,000 people in the APS working across 97 agencies and 14 portfolios in more than 567 locations across Australia and the globe. Through persuasive policy advice to government, through regulation and through service delivery, you touch the lives of every Australian. And you have continued to deliver day in and day out. The latest State of the Service report, and I know many of you sleep with it besides your bed, paints a picture of a service that is fully engaged and committed to the task facing us. I suspect it's not going to get any easier. The demands on good governance, on statecraft, and on our capacity to work as a cohesive public service will continue to grow as will the public's expectations of government. The world around us is changing at pace. Our attention has been dominated by crises over the last two years at home and abroad. For the APS, this has meant making rapid changes under increased, increasing pressure as the needs of citizens and governments shift dramatically. The pandemic continues to illustrate the increasing complexity for our work. A public health crisis with implications for our economy our regulatory system, national security, and how we deliver services, integrate technology and data, and mobilise our workforce. This pandemic will pass, but the challenges around geopolitical and societal volatility, technological change, and economic disruption will not. If we are to continue to serve effectively the, Australian, the government and the Australian people, we'll need a public service that is driven by data and the sophisticated utilisation of technology. We'll need an APS that is collaborative and works as one enterprise in dealing with increasingly complex and interconnected issues. We'll need diversity of ability, culture, gender and age. An APS that reflects the community that is modern Australia and we'll need an inclusive culture to leverage the breadth of perspectives and expertise that resides in each and every team across our organisation. And most fundamentally, we need an APS that adheres to its values, committed to service, ethical, respectful, accountable, and impartial. So where are we heading? Public service reform is in fact a never ending journey. Much of it is about cultural change and that takes time and coordinated leadership. But it's also about how we acquire, retain, and develop our capability to make sure that our employee value proposition is not fraying and that we stay competitive for talent. When David Thody presented his report to government it proposed wide-scale changes to ensure the APS was fit for the future. In essence, 
that he's focused on the need for a more joined up, people facing data enabled, capable and trusted public service, able to, to deliver effectively in a radically new operating context. The review was building on strong foundations. If you go back and look at Terry Moran's blueprint for reform in 2010, it is striking how the 30 review has built on this work. Now the government agreed with the majority of the independent panel's 40 recommendations and asked the Secretary's Board to take these forward. Our most leadership group, the Secretary's Board, has in fact seized that opportunity. It has used the pandemic to accelerate implementation of practical reforms that make a difference. The public service 10 years from now will look very different from the public service of today. So what does that mean for your work? Clearly it requires a very major focus on our people and our capability, APS reform. It is now one year since we launched the first APS workforce strategy. The strategy is the foundation for driving the alignment of APS initiatives and investment to attract the best, develop the capability of APS employees and mobilise people to our highest priority work. Implementation of the strategy is supported by the APSC Centre of Excellence for APS Workforce Planning Capability. This small team is having a high impact in its support across APS agencies, fostering workforce transformation across the enterprise as a whole, whilst meeting the unique circumstances of agencies. System level thinking is crucial, however, I strongly believe that ensuring the enduring capability of our people is in many ways at the heart of APS reform. Last year we established the APS Academy. It is a hub of learning for employees at all stages of their career with a focus on the core craft capabilities that are critical for world-class public service. Under each of these capabilities is an array of learning and development opportunities available to every APS employee irrespective of location and stage of your career. By way of example, these range from foundational training in topics such as integrity or delivering great policy, professional development in topics such as human-centred design or engaging stakeholders, through to the delivery of SES masterclasses that recognise the unique operating environment of the APS. An APS Academy faculty made up of respected current and recent APS senior practitioners guide the design and delivery of programmes on offer. It is part of a deliberate new approach to learning and development that leverages strengths and areas of expertise across the APS and seeks to embed a culture of continuous learning. One example is an EL2 professional development program under development. We're seeking to offer a flexible pathway for participants to choose learning components that emphasise particular areas of capability development aligned to APS-wide needs, for example, managing hybrid teams or developing leadership capabilities. And we're looking to start rolling out the program later this year, so you'll be hearing more about this over the coming months. An APS learning board made up of APS and external experts has also been established to look at new ways to build capability right across our 153,000 strong workforce to best support our people to develop the skills and expertise they need to deliver for the Australian people and communities we serve. One of its early priorities has been to reduce duplication and inefficiencies in L&D purchasing practices across the APS. A new learning marketplace is being explored, aimed at increasing competition and innovation in the market, and also ensuring we get the biggest capability uplift for dollars spent, and to ensure we can make the best use of our expertise and resources in a fast-moving and interconnected world. We've also undertaken a review of the APS hierarchy and classification. The review looks at ways to make sure we better value and utilise the expertise and contribution from people at all levels, roles, functions and locations across Australia. It addresses how modern and flexible ways of working can support more effective decision making, remove bureaucratic barriers and promote greater mobility and responsiveness. The pandemic underscored this need, with the APS demonstrating through COVID how empowered teams reduced hierarchy and a one APS mindset supported timely data-driven decisions by government and it can mobilise effort to the priority needs of our community. Structural change occurs rarely in the APS. In fact, in the 120 plus year history of the APS, the classification we have today is the result of two major reforms, a shake-up in the late 80s and then a move to the current APS and executive level structures in 1998. Nearly a quarter of a century on, and in a vastly different operating environment, 
it is not just timely but essential to ask whether our existing culture and structure inhibits our capacity for innovation, agility and delivery in today's world and for our leadership to demonstrate the willingness for bold change. Let me now turn to digital and ICT transformation. A digital review has provided a baseline for APS digital and ICT capabilities and we have a sharp focus now on a whole of APS approach to digital funding. Supported by the DTA, the APS is working together to ensure we're investing in the right things at the right time and moving in a strategic and coordinated way. One aspect of this is the sharing and reusing of digital capabilities to help optimise our investments across government. If one agency invests in a new technology, design, pattern or skill, we want the rest of the APS to be able to easily leverage this. The digital government strategy sees government using advanced technology to meet the needs and expectations of the public, offering stable, secure and reliable services. This digital service vision is already being tested every day, supporting record numbers of people seeking COVID-related support and more recently flood-related support. And while there's plenty of room for improvement, we are meeting this demand in ways we could not have imagined five or ten years ago. But technology alone, however, will only take us so far. The new Australian data strategy supports stronger decision making through making better use of our data. And it's critical that we continue to grow the necessary skills to make the best use of these transformative technologies and valuable data. These actions work hand in hand with the APS Academy and we have invested in growing data and digital capability directly through the APS professions. The digital and data professions have grown over the last 12 months with more than 3,000 of you signing up and accessing training, career development opportunities and communities of practice. And if you haven't signed up yet, I encourage you to do so through the APSC website. We have also had record, record number of applicants and participants coming through our data and digital entry level programs. Ultimately, however, improved APS capability is about delivering tangible benefits for the community we serve. We need to be careful about fads and remain utterly grounded in our approach to what needs to change and what remains of enduring value. We have a job to do now and that requires managing the increasingly compl increasing complexity and interconnectedness of issues and the expectations of government and the people. And we have to look ahead at a shifting horizon. Our reform ambitions need to keep moving without the changing landscape and also with the changing nature of work and the workplace often dubbed the future of work. Now first, we're living through a fundamental transformation in the nature of the work we do and the skills we need for a high-performing APS. Digital technology pervades work environments everywhere. To be a leading digital economy and take advantage of changes in machine learning, advances in artificial intelligence and digitalization, the APS needs to scale its digital infrastructure and skill its workforce. 71% of agencies have said they have critical skill shortages with data, digital and ICT, the most frequently reported. And let me illustrate the issue with this particular skill set. Australia is estimated to need approximately 156,000 more digital technology workers by 2025 against the backdrop of a global digital skill shortage. In reality, we are in a fiercely competitive labour market for talent and we need to get better at keeping up with rapidly changing skill requirements of our workforce. We are making strides to build strong capability pipelines for data and digital careers in the APS with, with initiatives like Career Pathfinder. At the same time, we need to develop data and digital literacy across our whole workforce. Now, second, we need to reimagine where we work, learning from the at-scale working from home experience and accessing new talent pools across the country to bring in the skills we need. We need to retain expertise and develop capabilities with our existing workforce, but that alone cannot provide all the solutions. We also need to bring in expertise to reinforce our capability. Our capacity to track these, uh, th these, those we need may require a substantial shift in our perceptions of where work can be done. Hybrid work, splitting time between both the office and home is, are not new concepts and will almost certainly be a feature of a contemporary APS. Whilst many of you are already doing this now, across the APS leaders we will need to be well equipped and leading and managing dispersed teams. The use of flexible working arrangements in the APS, including working from home, predates the COVID-19 pandemic and will be a mainstay for the APS to be seen as an employer of choice. 
However, we must continue to strike the right balance between flexible work arrangements and dealing on behalf of government and Australians. For example, many of us are employed in frontline roles or secure IT environments where the notion of flexible work may look very different. Skills shortages in the broader Australian labour market and strong competition for specialist talent and expertise increasingly requires flexibility and innovative ways in which to attract and retain our staff. For example, most of the digital and data roles are advertised within Canberra, but we know more than 90% of the talent with digital and data skills are located outside of the ACT. Decisions about flexibility and where we work can remove the geographic boundaries of recruitment. This also presents an opportunity for the APS by bringing us closer to the communities we serve, helping to improve service delivery and design. Crucially, however, in a competitive war on, for talent, it enables us to tap into labour markets right across Australia. And third, the COVID experience has shown that flexibility is possible in the APS and new ways of working can empower staff and deliver positive outcomes. One of the successes of this period has been the ability of the APS to work together with new opportunities for different parts of government to come together. Public servants have also been deployed across the APS at a pace and scale never seen before. One example of this is the APS Surge Reserve. More than 4,500 people were deployed over the past two years from across the APS to surge to priority work. As we speak, approximately 500 people are deployed to Services Australia from 23 APS agencies, assisting process disaster payments to Australians as a result of the devastating floods in New South Wales and Queensland in early March. This collaboration and enterprise-wide approach means skills, knowledge and capacities can be drawn across organisational boundaries to better meet the urgent needs of Australians. The need for collaboration across traditional agency lines will continue. We will need to ensure that our culture and structure are well suited to this way of operating. Today, 50% of employees in the APS are digital natives from Gen Y and Gen Z who expect their, their roles to reflect technological advances and new ways of working. Building on a strong platform of continuous reform and to prepare for the future of work, a new Future of Work Secretaries Board subcommittee and cross-agency task force has been established to develop practical and evidence-based actions to ensure we attract, develop and retain the capabilities and talent we need for the future. Now I want to finish up by talking about the relationship between the public service and ministers and their officers. It is timely to do so given a federal election will take place shortly. Irrespective of outcome, it will signal a, a, a renewed agenda from the government of the day. Our caretaker conventions guide our approach once an election is called and we enter the caretaker period. Each of us should already be thinking about how the caretaker conventions will apply to our work. How the APS manages transition in election context is one of the ways we act with impartiality and demonstrate our wider stewardship. One of the great strengths of Australian democracy is the way we manage transition between governments or ensure continuity and renewal for a return government. This of course is underpinned by the preparation of incoming government briefs, the red and the blue books, provided to the party voting into power by the people. The smooth management of transition is fundamental for the safety and prosperity of Australians. But more than that, a strong partnership between the APS ministers and their staff is at the core of the Westminster system, and it operates at its best when characterised by mutual trust, respect and confidence. Not every member of the APS will have direct contact with ministers and their staff, but it is important every member of the APS is aware of our respective roles. Working with a ministerial liaison reference panel, a set of guides have been published to support the APS, establish strong partnerships. They cover working with ministers, the role of departmental liaison officers, the operating environment of a ministerial office and ministerial transitions. With the APS Academy, the panel has also assisted to develop and deliver a new strengthening partnerships SES uh, learning program. And we're now building on that work to develop a complementary program for parliamentarians and their staff to ensure that they can get the best from the APS. So let me conclude. I do not need to remind you that there are both natural and global forces at work that will throw up complex challenges for us as a service to manage. And the clarity around the forms they will actually take is mixed. It was the philosopher Kierkegaard who said events can only be understood backwards but must be lived forwards. 
They'll require fine-tuned statecraft and the APS working at its best. If we are to serve effectively the Australian people and the government, we'll need to work in partnership and as one APS to harness diverse perspectives and knowledge that our organisation can bring. It's not by chance that the Australian Public Service is one of the best in the world. It's because of the sense of service that you all embody and the values that guide our work, including political impartiality, merit-based appointments, hard-headed advice and stewardship of the system by our senior leaders. So thank you again for all the work you've done and I wish you well in 2022. And back to you, Colin. Thank you, Peter. A reminder that Peter will be joining our panel discussion if you have any questions. One of the themes that Peter just mentioned was 1APS and how we are all working towards the same goal. At the end of last year, a video was created to showcase just how diverse the APS is. We'd like to show this to you now. Hi, I'm Kanchi from Newcastle. Hi, I'm Mark from Hobart. I'm Yana from Canberra, which is not all country. I'm Simon from Brisbane. I'm Kay and I work in Geelong, Victoria. My name is Mirage and I'm based in sunny Nauru. I'm Zara, based in Fitzroy Crossing, over 3,800 kilometres away from Canberra. What 1APS means to me is working towards something bigger than yourself. Engaging, collaborating and sharing knowledge. No barriers between agencies. We already have a good history of coming together to solve complex problems. Bringing all of that diversity that people bring with their backgrounds. Through teamwork and collaboration. This is 1APS in action. We provide face-to-face -face service support to our most vulnerable, remote, disadvantaged and Indigenous customers. I've helped customers with bushfire claims, with flood claims, even cyclone claims. Helping Australians from culturally and linguistically diverse background. Bettering the lives of the Australian community. <laughs> like this little guy. I want to have one APS that can demonstrate people um, with disabilities in leadership um, positions. It's just been great to be part of one APS where we all work together. Towards a common goal as one APS. One APS. We're now going to move into our panel discussion. A reminder that if you have any question for the panel, please send it through the question and answer tab on GovTeams. If you see a question and also want to hear the answer, you can like the question to vote it up. As I mentioned earlier, we have Chris Spira and Ali Jenkins joining Peter for our panel session. Chris is a Deputy Chief Executive Officer for Services Australia, with responsibility for administering programs that protect the integrity of government outlays for health and welfare services. Chris joins us online at another location in Canberra. Ali is a First Assistant Secretary at the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, with responsibility for leading the APS Reform Office. Ali joins us from Hobart. Thank you both for joining us today. Chris, my first question is for you. As the APS manages back-to-back -back crises from COVID to natural disasters, what are your tips for maintaining resilience at work? Thanks for the question. That really uh, sort of leads off well from, from the Commissioner's statement before about the criticality of the Australian public service uh, to the delivery of the government's responses uh, to COVID, but also to the natural disasters that we've seen over the last couple of years. And uh, I think a key part of the, the resilience is, is a focus both uh, as members and, and particularly leaders, people of leadership roles in the Australian public service to focus both on self and on team. Uh, there is that, that responsibility and need for uh, on their, uh, their own health sort of support, support their teams. Being that the, those of our staff expect a new reality we've emerged from the years is acknowledgement will bring whole selves to work. Um, I think that's always been, been the reality, but I think over the last couple of years there's been a greater discourse and a greater acknowledgement that people do bring the whole reality. People bring stresses from or, or concerns from other parts of their life, including work to work. 
and people, uh, both leaders, need to sort of acknowledge and 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 uh, uh, make sure that that sort of they consider that. But I think also as part of, uh, as the commissioner said, that the, the competition for talent, people are expecting that within their workplaces, and so we need to sort of acknowledge that people are bringing uh, their whole selves to work. In terms of of helping the resilience of teams, I think I think really communication is is a criticality. Uh, communication from from leaders centrally, uh, and and that needs to be authentic, needs to be credible, and most of all, it needs to be engaging. Uh, one thing we're we're very aware of now is is the critical role of of engagement with work, of of the sense of of personal engagement and achievement, in terms of avoiding burnout and in ensuring that, that, that productivity is maintained by people and, and performance. And so needing to, to make sure that uh, we continue to engage with people, make people feel valued, uh, express Chris, I think we're starting to lose some of your response. We might acknowledge just... that out the, the uh, uh, response we, we, we might just pause there. I think we got the, the, the broad... Sorry, uh, is, it, uh, <laughs> is it a technical issue? We, we are. We're starting to, to break up in, in parts of that, but I, I think we got most of what you were saying, but I might uh, hold it there if that's okay. I, I don't want to risk losing the rest of it. Um, Ella, we might move to you if that's all right. Um, so my next question, you led the task force that delivered a review into the APS classification framework last year. What did that work tell you about what the future of the APS might look like? Um, thanks, Kylie. I'm just checking you can hear me before I uh, go on. I can hear you yep. clearly. You know, I'm appearing from, from Hobart, <laughs> so, you know, fast distance to travel. Um, look, this is an incredibly interesting review to be a part of. For anyone who's not aware of the background of the review, it was commissioned after the independent review of the APS, which was led by David Thody. That review found um, that we really needed to look at our, our structures to make sure that they were as streamlined as possible and that they were fit for the future. Um, the review was led by two former secretaries, um, Heather Smith and Finn Pratt, as well as a senior business leader, Catherine Fagg, who's also the chair of the CSIRO. Um, uh, we undertook a significant number of consultations, uh, workshops, um, he had a lot of conversations with um, private sector, state jurisdictions and um, international jurisdictions and we, we looked at best practice. Um, there are a couple of really, really clear themes about the future of work that this work uncovered. Um, uh, Peter highlighted this before. There's a really um, significant composition, uh, compositional shift in the generation of who is becoming a public servant? We've got 50% um, Gen Y and Gen Z. Um, but we've got a system that was founded back <laughs> in the 80s. Um, and uh, so it, there's a lot of different things that motivates public servants and the, the, the coming generations of public servants uh, that's different to, to sort of what our system was motivated. Um, if you think about other sorts of uh, sociological shifts that have occurred in that time, massive digital, digital and technological shifts. So we don't, in most cases, we don't walk around buildings kind of handing a piece of paper to this person who then hands it to that person who hands it to that person. Um, stuff flies around the system digitally. That means we need to structure our teams different, differently. Um, in the last 30 years, uh, Australia has had uh, just absolutely superb and significant shifts in the way um, uh, that people have accessed education and higher education. So we have a much more highly skilled workforce as well. We've got to make the most of it. Um, when we try and understand what newer generations of public servants care about, um, uh, and this is a really consistent theme, everyone really values job security, but after that, they value that sense of being able to make a contribution, give as much of themselves as they can. And that's not facilitated by a system 
where you're not, when your your contribution is, it might be devalued by by your rank. Um, there, we learned a lot about different um, approaches to team structures, and we're seeing some themes. We see we see this happening a bit already in the public servant service. We're seeing more webbing between portfolios. The surge reserve is a really good example of that webbing. Um, but we also see it in the way that task forces operate. We see um, a collection of portfolios coming together, um, putting aside some of their portfolio differences um, and, and solving problems. So we're seeing more webbing. We're seeing different and more flexible team structures. Um, uh, the other thing, and um, Peter, you know, Peter touched on a lot of the technological changes in terms of how you know AI is 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 um, uh, shifting some of the more routinized work and allowing us to have more complex work. Um, there's a range of you know technological shifts there, but the other thing is about what what kind of culturally inclusive workforce do we want to have. What the panel learned from the private, uh, their conversations with the private sector is that values-driven organisations that are culturally inclusive um, are, are more responsive, they deliver more, more effectively. Um, there was one quote from one of our workshops from an APS level staff member that has really stuck with me and really guides my thinking about hierarchy in the APS. This person said, in the APS, you are a rank first and you are a person second. And we don't want that. We want an APS where, as Chris says, you bring your whole self to work. Um, you make a contribution, that contribution is valued. Um, and so there's a lot of different sorts of cultural expectations um, that we also want to promote in, the, in a future APS. Kyle, I might just come in uh, just off the back of what both Chris said and what, uh, what Ali was saying. And, and that is one of the aspects we're looking at is very much around capability uplift and particularly around the management of people. And it came through very strongly in the recommendations of, 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 of the review on hierarchy and classification. And that is we've got you know, 13,000 EL2s, for example. They're all managing people, but have they been trained to manage people? What, what, what development assistance have we provided them? And it's inconsistent. It varies from agency to agency. Some do it very well. Some are still uh, grasping with, ha with this particular uh, aspect. And so we as a centre need to play a much bigger role, and the Academy will come into this on a hub and spoke approach, into how we, how we actually do that training for e EL2s. How do we make sure that they can manage people, that they can develop themselves to be the best leaders they can be? And it goes to Chris's point about resilience and communication, because it's been hard. I mean, having to manage people <coughs> remotely, uh, as, we, as, we, as we were doing during COVID, it was without any training or guidance, has been quite uh, has been you know, challenging for many of us. And so I think there's some real work that we will be focusing over the next 12 months around how do we roll out uh, training to people who manage people, it's not just EL2s, it's EL1s, APS6s, and we go down the line. And we need to do a much better job at that rather than just expecting people to do it uh, but, you know, just by innately. So, Peter, I might ask a question then building off that then. <coughs> um, uh, many, many departments will have had staff who've come through the ranks and, and been um, promoted. They were technical experts. What do you see as some of the differences in the adaptive leadership uh, that the public service needs to build in its capability as opposed to some of the perhaps technical uh, leadership and, and strategies that will have been there in the past? Yeah, <coughs> sorry. Again, it came through in, 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 the, um, in the report that Ali Jenkins was very much involved with on hierarchy in class. The concept that you actually need people who can lead, who have the empathy to lead and, and, and the sort of the skills and, uh, to lead. And the people who actually are, uh, are technical experts have great skills, but aren't particularly interested in managing teams of people, and nor may they have the training or interest to do so in the future. And so it's one of the areas we, have, we, we looked at very closely in the hierarchy and classification review as well, is how do we ensure we, we are able to, to attract, retain, and develop our capability around real expertise, and also around people in leadership positions and how we can take them forward. And you need to look at them quite differently. 
and not, not, not just expect uh, everyone to be a leader. They may have real skills in their particular field and they may be just very comfortable doing that for their career. Um, so that's, that's, I think that's one, sort of, one, one of the sort of fundamental areas that we're looking to sort of focus in on and how, how, how you establish systems to allow that to happen. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, now we're starting to get some of the questions through from the audience, so thank you. Um, Ali, first up for you. Uh, how will we equip leaders to manage people in a variety of work settings, so flexible work arrangements, and will this be a critical enabler for the future of our workforce in attracting and retaining the best candidates? Um, you know, this is a, a question and these concepts that I feel really strongly about. So I, I grew up in Canberra, not in a public servant family. I grew up in a, you know, a family of tradies. I had no idea what the public service was like really before I joined it. Um, and then I spent a big chunk of my career um, in Canberra, but I moved to Tasmania um, two and a half years ago. Um, and I, I, you know, I've spent a lot of time in my career in the central agencies, but particularly in PM and C. And I had no idea how I could do my job from, you know, not not in the PM and C building not sort of staying in touch with all of those relationships that I'd, um, you know, sort of nurtured over the years. Um, and then of course, sort of everyone had that experience of trying to identify how they could work and be effective in a different environment. Um, I think one of the things that, you know, really helps um, to sort of build leaders to operate in different environments is knowing um, and this was helpful for me, is that knowing there's actually quite a lot of leaders already out there who are working and leading remote teams and have been doing it in the public service for, for a long time. So learning from, from them, um, uh, having support for different arrangements makes a huge difference. Um, I've found that I can't just pretend that I am you know, I'm in person and try and do things exactly the same way. You have to find different ways to do things to make things work. I had this great advice from somebody who um, had been working um, within pm and in an international role, but from overseas. And she said, this gives you the best opportunity to empower your staff because the meetings you can't go to, they can go to they can, um, you can develop their skills um, and they can participate in different ways that otherwise you might not have felt comfortable with. And I thought, what a great opportunity to take um, uh, the kind of complexities of, of working in a role um, remotely and use that to enhance and, and develop others. One thing I would say though, is that I think it's really, really important because in so many parts of the public service, we have something akin to an apprenticeship model. Um, you learn a lot from the people that you're around. Um, you learn a lot from observing people, um, overhearing things um, and sort of absorbing that and, and reflecting on it. So I think we still need to make sure um, that as we're, we're moving towards more hybrid, hybrid structures, that we're able to integrate some of those sort of real strengths of, of being on the ground into the way that we um, nurture um, nurture staff and make sure that that's, that's still a part of what we do. Okay, thanks, Ben Ali. And uh, I certainly would agree, and I don't think it matters uh, how long you've been in the public service or what level you get to, that opportunity to learn from one another and continue to develop the craft continues, uh, uh, probably long after you leave the public service as well. <laughs> Uh, Peter, the next question's for you. What is the APSC doing to streamline the recruitment processes in the APS when we have so many different systems and processes? Yeah, no, uh, that's a good question. I mean, agencies tend to be very attracted to their ability to recruit their staff. And what we've tried to do since I, I've been in this job over the last nearly four years is to start to sort of re-centralise bits of it. So, for example, we, 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 we centralise recruiting on an opt-in basis around data uh, through the data profession. And ABS, for example, will recruit for a whole range of departments and agencies for data specialists. Uh, the tax department will do that for uh, strategic human resources personnel. Um, 
um, DTA have been doing that for, um, for digital uh, people, um, Treasury for economists. So we're trying to centralise it as much as we can. Uh, well, and uh, that, that's actually working, but it's a sort of work in progress, I have to say. And of course, finance does it, um, which is an interesting example. They've been doing it for um, school leavers, early entry uh, starters, uh, for again, for across the public service. And that's sort of working. And that's also points in a direction where we're heading at the moment as well, in terms of we've tended to wait till people graduate from university before we um, bring them into the public service. That's too late. We need to be attracting them much earlier on in their studies, whether they're at TAFE or whether they're at university. And so there are a whole range of programs now, whether they're cadetships, apprenticeships, internships, and there are all sorts of different nomenclature around that. And we're trying to rationalise that. So we're very conscious of two things. Um, it, and Chris mentioned this earlier about how competitive it is for talent out there. So we're very conscious we need to get, get to people earlier, bring them into the public service earlier, either on a part-time or full-time basis, and also have them study at the same time. And we also do need to re-centralise to a certain extent as well. So we're, we're working on that. And then, of course, <coughs> around in terms of diversity around Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, uh, in terms of their recruitment, in terms of people with disability and their recruitment, again, we're looking to see how, how, much, how much more we need to take, take the, the re-centralisation uh, forward. But I'm very keen on this. Uh, I mean, I joined, I joined Foreign Affairs back in 1981, and I didn't even know I joined the public service. And that's, <clears throat> I mean, that, that's a terrible thing in a way. But it did, it did, did reflect the culture of the Department of Foreign Affairs at, at that time. And we're all part of one APS. And I keep coming back to the point that we are so, issues are so interconnected, so complex now, that we need to work as one, as one unit and be naturally collaborative, not just think of ourselves as I, I work for you know, um, PM&C, for example, with Ali or Services Australia, which is Chris, um, and that uh, my job is to look after the interests of my department or my agency, but actually think I have a job to do as part of a wider system, and I need to be, have collaborative relationships across the system to make me able to do my job better. And I think the earlier we can start that in terms of recruitment, the better, but it's a work in progress. Thank you. Uh, Chris, hopefully we've resolved the technical issues. We have our next question for you. What do you see as the main challenges for service delivery in the APS? Well, I think um, that, that, that's an, an excellent question. I think, I think it actually leads on from a lot of what we've been talking about, about societal changes and so differences of, of, uh, in terms of people's expectations of service delivery. And, and differences of um, the changes in terms of, of what government expects from service delivery. And I think what we've seen is the Australian Public Service and its ability to develop programs, provide policy advice, and then to deliver uh, services that are meaningful to Australians, particularly those in, in, in dire need, uh, really sort of um, take off over the last couple of years both in a COVID sense, but also in a natural disaster sense. And so that speed and scale of delivery is, is really important. Uh, the, the, the channels, uh, people expect multi-channel uh, options of, of how to engage with service delivery. Uh, they don't sort of want a one size fits all, but want to be able to engage in a way that they're most comfortable and at a time that, that, that they want to. And I think the, the movement of, of many of our services that we're administering on behalf of government uh, to being digital and, and providing digital offerings are a good option for that because it does provide people with the ability to uh, put in claims that would maintain claims that times of their own choosing what students, what, what else is happening in their life rather than having to fit it around our opening hours. But then that really important people to engage through telephony or indeed through face to face. We're seeing that now with people on the ground helping to deliver to people who, who have been through uh, quite a natural disaster. So it is about scale, but about providing choice and recognise 
uh, people have a lot in their life. One thing they do as Australia is we want to make government services simple so people can get on with their lives, but also recognise that a government has quite a unique role in that. Uh, we need to make sure that there's channels available to people uh, who are most vulnerable in, in society and, and who have challenges uh, engaging through, through, say, digital channels or a particular channel, and so give them a variety of, of choice. And I think that's, that's going to continue to be sort of a focus for service delivery into the future, uh, and, and we can sort of ease that and give people greater choice by putting the citizen at the centre of our design so that we can deliver uh, better services uh, which is suited to, to the individual. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. And, and I think that point around putting the, uh, the citizen at the centre uh, obviously is a point that resonates for all departments. Um, uh, often it gets talked about and we see in, in terms of the delivery end of it, but actually that starts way back when we're thinking about policy mm. uh, all the way through to the delivery point. Uh, the next question that's come through is for uh, the panel more broadly. So I'll, uh, I'll call out the question and then uh, whoever would like to go first is welcome to the floor. Is there a reason why APS advertised positions are still location-based rather than available to all employees at all locations, considering the flexibility of work from home and the use of technology that we've got available? Kylie, can I go on this one? <laughs> because I've got some recent data that I think is a bit interesting. So, you know, I, I'm obviously, as someone who uh, doesn't work in Canberra, really open-minded about the idea of um, uh, you know, diversity of locations. So in my um, division at PMNC, we did a four or five round um, about a year ago. We advertised it as sort of Canberra, um, you know, Canberra only. We were open to flexibility, but we weren't super overt about it. I was okay. We got, we got 40 applications. That's fine. Got some good people out of it. Um, a year later, another four or five round, advertise it as all locations, um, uh, we're really avert about uh, accepting um, remote, uh, remote working. Um, and we also did a, a, some more um, active engagement with Indigenous organisations to get some more Indigenous candidates. We had 185 applications. 20% um, uh, of them were in Canberra, 80% outside Canberra. Um, the different splits, uh, uh, but our diversity splits were incredible. I think it was something like 35% identified as coming from a culturally and linguistically diverse background, 20% um, LGBTQI+. We got six Indigenous candidates, um, uh, maybe uh, sort of 11 or 12% identifying as having a disability. Um, look, this was mind blowing for us. Um, uh, and it just said a lot to me about um, the potential that's out there when when we um, uh, we have the ability to open up opportunities. You can't do that um, for every role, but I, I definitely think um, um, there's a lot more data out there out there that's suggesting that it's it's going to um, open us up to some uh, more competitive um, staffing markets, and it's also going to you know make a much more diverse APS. Thanks, Ali. Yeah, and there's a lot in what Ali said, that we, we in, in the pursuit of talent, we have to actually go to where the talent is and can't expect the talent just to come to Canberra. And, and there's a lot in that. And particularly around diversity, and you say Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders often want to be closer to their community, we need to be thinking much more imaginatively about where we get our staff from and how we set up the structures to enable uh, that to happen. But you've also got to keep in mind also that Canberra is a seat, is a seat of government. It's where, it's where the parliament is, it's where the ministers are. And so if you look at the data, you'll see that something like 66%, I think it is, don't quote me, uh, it's in the state of service report, uh, other the APS is actually based outside of Canberra, although heavily concentrated in capital cities, not actually in the regions, which is interesting. Um, but you flip that for the, for the senior executive service, who are basically based uh, mm. in Canberra. And it, we're getting better at allowing the SES to be out of Canberra, but it is hard because there is the, the, to, if you want to be a real player in the centre of government and deal with ministers, as you often have to do at that level, there is that expectation you spend a lot of time in Canberra. You don't, I don't have to live here, but you need to spend a lot of time here. 
So uh, I, it, it's obviously so. I mentioned to you the um, the work that the Secretary of Future Work Subcommittee is doing, and a lot of their thinking is, of course, around um, around where we work, not just how we work. And so it is something very much on the agenda because it's about how we attract our talent in the end. Thanks, yeah. and, and I'd agree that, that uh, I think Canberra will be a, the central hub of the APS. Uh, uh, while it remains to the, the city of government, so, so well, there is a, a cult issue I think sometimes and on the panel two years have proven that, that we can work in, in uh, distributed teams uh, and, and remotely I think like that, that and so there's still a lot of people who whose mission is probably that step that you can look out there, there, there is that sort of a shift that takes time um, and I think it's something that can make their, their abilities and their skills so that they can uh, manage effectively teams that that are, are distributed. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Um, another question for uh, all panel members to consider. So what are we doing to retain the knowledge and be more targeted with valuing our older workforce, supporting them to share this experience so that it's not lost? Okay, I, I might kick off on that. Um, we are, we, we have sort of formal strategies in relation to uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, uh, people with disability, and of course gender. They're the three sort of formal strategies we have out. We're also looking at the moment uh, at a sort of an action plan around the mature workforce. Uh, I mean, that is an issue. Um, the average age of our, I think the average age now of the APS is around 42.5 or something like that. But it is an aging work. It is an aging workforce, and there's an awful lot of talent which is now moving out. Um, so what do you do with that? Uh, how do you stay? How do you stay in touch with that? And I, I think, as I say, the action plan is still in development. We're looking around things like alumni. Um, more uh, basically staying in touch with people when they leave. I would actually like to do that with people at, at any level. Uh, I mean, I do see the future of the Australian Public Service being more porous. People come and go. And so then, then it's important to think about how you stay in touch with people. And this is people in the sort of, you know, in, in the sort of prime of their careers, but also that elderly workforce. Because the question, the question is, is absolutely right. There's a lot of experience and knowledge which is walking out the door. How do we stay in touch with it? How can we bring that back in for certain uh, certain occasions, certain surges? So it is something we're looking at, and this action plan will try to address some of these issues as well. Peter, uh, Chris, I know this was something that um, Services Australia previously had, had through through alumni programs and other things, uh, and certainly with the uh, response to COVID, um, there had been some of that drawn upon. Is there other um, actions within Services Australia that you're considering for this? I think we lost Chris. I think we might have lost the connection to Chris. <laughs> we'll pause on it, that one. It was all, it's been wobbly all along and now it's gone. It's all right. Uh, Ali. Certainly, certainly um, something focused on uh, with movements. I can still hear a little bit of Chris. <laughs> Do you want me to go, Kylie? Or? What? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I think... Um, uh, I mentioned before this sort of apprenticeship model that we really try to encourage. And to have an apprenticeship model, you do have to have the wisdom um, and the experience to help sh shape and craft the experiences of those who are coming um, sort of through the junior ranks of the public service. Uh, um, I, you know, my most influential mentor was um, uh, a manager I had who is in her 50s and she taught me skills that um, will will just stay with me for my whole career because she had so many battles she had so many different incredible experiences um, so I think that there's a 
a big part of valuing that experience in, in kind of building and crafting um, the skills that we have throughout the public service. The other thing though, I think that's sort of really important is to sort of understand also as people are um, heading into the last sort of five to 10 years of their expected um, working life, what would their preferred working patterns be? It might not be full time. Um, it, there might be different sorts of, of, of ways of working that are much more appealing. Um, and so understanding that better, and I, you know, I expect that that's sort of part of what, of what Peter's working on as well. Thanks, Ali. Um, Peter, the next question is specifically for you. Is the APSC looking to lower the cost of APS training to enable employees from agencies with smaller budgets to attend? Well, we set up, we, we have set up uh, an, a, an APS a learning board, which consists of a number of the very senior chief operating officers in the APS and, and some externals. Uh, and they're looking at essentially the learning marketplace. Uh, when 30 did his review um, three years ago, one of, one of the challenges he found is he couldn't actually identify how much we spent on training in terms of various departments, and he couldn't actually identify the quality of, of that training. And we're very focused on trying to understand uh, who, do, who does what and who does it well, and, use, and, and essentially use this, um, this learning board to facilitate a real understanding of, of how, we do our, how we do our training and, and development. And of course, we have the academy, the APS Academy, but again, w we're looking that, for that really uh, to, just to be one part of the ecosystem. We're not looking to displace training done by other agencies, which is very important to their particular work that they do. But we are looking to use the learning board and to use the APS Academy to get a much better understanding of who are the good deliverers, who does things well, and of course, price is, is a part of that. So hopefully, through the work of the learning board, this is just really we've gone from design, we've gone from scoping this to actually now design phase. Uh, hope, and hopefully, through this mechanism, we'll have a much better understanding of who the really good deliverers are, who does it well, and of course, that will also impact on price. So at least you're getting value for, uh, value for money. So that is something we are thinking about. Thanks, Peter. Um, that was our last question. So uh, that brings our panel discussion to a close. I'd like to thank our speakers, Peter, Ali and Chris, for sharing their experiences today. I'd also like to thank all of you for watching and contributing to the New South Wales edition of the State of the Service Roadshow. A recording of the session will be made available on the APSC website shortly. Thank you.